Hello, everyone. This is Cabane. Uh, we are back with the one, the only, the lovely Perry Robinson to continue our discussion on uh, Christology, on, on Orthodoxy, and just on all of these interesting issues. Um, so I wanted to start the second part by asking you about the way in which Christology plays a governing role in other theological questions, which we don't necessarily intuitively think of as being controlled by Christology, specifically um, universalism and um, predestinarianism. Because one point that you've made, which I thought was very insightful, is that universalism arises again within specifically a reformed context. And this is tied up in antiquity with Christology. And you've argued um, that predestinarianism is all tied up with Christological issues as well. So how would you explain this historical phenomenon and how are these historical phenomena, um, how are they governed by more kind of intellectual connections? Yeah, I think the issues have a long history going back to origin um, and certain philosophical problems there uh, for I think a, a book that does a, a good job in giving you origins, cosm soteriological cosmology. It's called Journey Back to God. It's not written by me. I forget the author's name, but I believe it's from, it's either an AAR book or it's Oxford book, but it's called Journey Back to God, Origin and the Problem of Evil, I believe is the subtitle. And um, so that's kind of the, the, the back history in terms of the, the, the seminal source in the Christian tradition with origin where you have a primordial unity, you have oneness, and that unity kind of breaks apart, and you have a fall into bodies, you have a, then a, a savior who comes to bring all the different parts back into unity, and that takes a very long process, a uh, resurrection of the flesh, which eventually transmutes the flesh into something that's not flesh, and then there's a reabsorption back in, into the one. And this all has to do, a lot of it has to do, for example, in Aeneid 4 in Plotinus uh, with respect to freedom. In Aeneid 4, Plotinus talks about the fall of soul, and there he means cosmic soul, not individual souls, fall of soul into body. And he talks about it being free, but also determined, right? So it's this kind of thing that had to happen but it's also something that was desired or willed by by world soul and that's how you got individual souls and bodies um and plotinus there avails himself of standard stoic arguments about the compatibility of free will and determinism uh, along the lines of secondary causation so the idea of secondary causation would be roughly uh, a cylinder rolls because it's round not because god pushed it Right? So there's no direct causation there. The cylinder rolls because it's round and other forces in the world. There are many causal forces at a certain plane. And so it's determined in terms of what it is. Um, and so in that sense, it's circumstantially free. And that's important because those arguments get picked up to some extent uh, by Augustine of Hippo, um, partly through his influence of Plotinus and then also the cosmological material from Origen. Uh, in terms of that schema, much of which Augustine historicizes. So to come up to the Protestant tradition, um, if people are interested, for example, in the Reformed tradition, the classic text in modern literature is Richard Mueller's Christ in the Decree, Christology and Predestination from Calvin to Perkins. So, <clears throat> which is not, I mean, it's an academic book. It's not like after dinner reading or something like this. Um, so if people want to see the Christological issues at play, some of it you can see there. I disagree with Mueller's understanding of, of things, but that would be a way to see it in the Reformed tradition. So people remember in our previous part of the discussion, I talked about how in the Augustinian tradition, Augustine takes baptism, infant baptism, to be proof of, and baptismal regeneration to be proof of predestinarianism, that God can predestine people apart from their will. The other example that Augustine gives is Christ. Christ is the predestined man. And so um, this raises issues in Augustinian Christology, but it also 
those same issues come up in a more refined way in Reformation Christology and reform in the Reformed tradition. And so what you have, at least in some Reformation thinkers like Calvin and his teacher Vermigli, uh, and we cannot underestimate the importance of Vermigli because if Vermigli had not been executed, we would not be talking about Calvinism. We would be talking about Vermiglianism, uh, most likely. So Vermigli is very influenced by Theodore of Cyrus, who your listeners may know was a very sympathetic to um, Nestorius. And uh, if you ever want to make a Coptic person very mad, just call him Theodoret. That'll probably do it. Um, all my Coptic friends should laugh at this. So if they don't, I'll call them Nestorius. <clears throat> In any case, um, the way Vermigli thinks of Christology is this, and then we'll get to the predestinarian stuff very quickly. Um, he thinks of God the Word and the man being united by God the Word using the man through his will. All right. And that unity comprises the outward person or appearance of Christ or the Son. So Vermigli will talk about in his dialogue on the two natures of Christ against the Lutheran theologian Brenz, for example, he will talk about at the crucifixion that God the Word is merely present at the crucifixion, but it's the man who dies. Right? God the Word for Vermigli does not suffer does not suffer death. Um, the classic reduplicative way of talking about that, contra Vermigli and other Nestorian or Nestorianizing figures, would be to say that God the Word suffers a human death, or he suffers as man. But that's not the way that Vermigli talks about it. So you have a, a dual subject Christology of two persons under a single appearance that are related by an act of will. So there's really only one will going on there. So you have a kind of monothelitism in Nestorianism. You'd think that Nestorianism would have two wills, but it really only has one. And that's because of certain intuitions and in action theory that if one thing is using another, then it can't, the thing that's being used can't be the will. So if God the Word is using the will, the, the man by will, then there's really only one principle at work. There's only one power. And so you have a determinating relationship, a deterministic relationship there, where God the Word is determining the human subject to act in certain ways. Well, that Christological model is just the prime instance of uh, Reformation anthropology or the way that the, uh, Vermigli and Calvin in predestinarian schema Think of God's relationship to humans in general, right? The divine will predestinates and determines what you do, right? Adding secondary causation for the reformed doesn't change that. It's still deterministic, okay? So I don't, that's why I don't think those Stoic arguments that they pick up from Augustine um, really help or do any real work. But that's the model that you have. It's a form of monothelitism. So monergism in anthropology and soteriology is really, in my view, an instance of monothelitism. Um, there, it's, it's the same basic schema. It's just in different parts of the theological system. And which comes first, do you think? Do you think that um, uh, the architects of this way of thinking begin with monergism and then they end up becoming um, monothelites, or do you think they begin as monothelites and then they end up as monergists? I think it's more the former. It's complicated because you have other people, for example, who are not monergists like William Lane Craig, who is a monothelite, a self-confessed monothelite, right? So you can be a monothelite and not have this, though I think Craig in his Christology falls back into it because he's got the, the Christ that's at the level of consciousness, and then you have the subliminal Christ who's using the conscious Christ, which is like, well, why aren't we back to a dual subject Christology again that you were trying to avoid in the first place? But that's a digression. It, so in general, what I think is 
they were so committed to the monergism because they were reacting to the neo semi pelagianism of Beale and other certain Franciscans, and they really weren't familiar with Thomas uh, or a stronger Augustinian tradition in Aquinas, among other people. And so, I mean, this is why when you read in the bondage of the will, Luther goes so far as to argue for stoic mechanistic determinism. That like chemicals and things are determining how you make choices. Your body parts are determining, which now is just anathema to the Reformation tradition. So, I mean, Luther, to be fair, moved away from that. But early on, if you read Bondage of the Will, he's, make, he's making appeal to, to stoic determinism, to mechanistic determinism. Um, so I think that it was just that commitment. And then I think through going through Augustine and then the influence of origin on Augustine and using Christology as a primary example of predestination, um, I think that's what I think that's what led to it, uh, and becoming more conscious of that kind of structuring relationship. Also, with respect to the issue of the decrees in Reformed theology, right? Christ is is related to the Father in a subordinating relationship with respect to the decrees. He is under, in a sense, the decrees. Um, this problem is not something I made up. You can see it in Karl Barth. He talks about it. There are plenty of other non-Bardians who discuss it, which is one of the whole entire reason Richard Mueller wrote that book, Christ and the Decree, is to try and engage that issue. And in part, the issue that this schema seems to fall afoul of Chalcedonian Christology. That's in part what Mueller is trying to, to save the Reformed tradition from. I don't think he does, but this is, I mean, it's not just like, oh, the evil Karl Barth came up with this. It's, it's, it's recognized, but the problem is most reformed people don't see this stuff because they're always too busy reading other things at a much lower level. It's not till you get into the higher level literature that you start seeing these issues um, in, in reformed Christology or in reformed Trinitarianism. Like, is there a general view of God behind the Trinity on Didea Uno? I mean, that's a huge issue for, for Calvin in, in terms of um, his Trinitarianism. So, you have this determinating relationship between humanity and divinity that has a Christological root and is rooted in a Christological error. Now, um, it's not really that far of a jump to go from God predestines some people to God predestines everybody. And that's exactly what you see in the, um, the United States with the growth of universal, modern universalism it came out of the Calvinists. Now, the interesting thing here is that the Unitarian and Universalists were not initially allies. They were actually enemies. In the United States, the Unitarians were fairly committed to the doctrine of eternal punishment or eternal suffering. And they were the kind of the highbrow intellectual elite and cultural elite and economic. It was, it was playing class warfare here. Um, they were the high class people and they looked down their nose at the uh, universalists. The universalists were the fiery popular street preachers and their union didn't come about till much, much later um, when it turned out that the Unitarians didn't really wanna believe in hell or much of anything else anymore. I mean, it's, it's like the joke of what, what do you get when you cross a Jehovah's Witness with a Unitarian? A knock at the door for no apparent reason, right? Um, so, the, the irony is, for example, for the Reformed, is the Reformed always want to talk about how, you know, Rome has all these errors and things like this and everybody else, all this stuff, you know, this problem, liberalism or this problem came out of Rome or came out of somebody else or the Orthodox have this mysticism and all this kind of stuff. But they never want to talk about how universalism came out of, the, came out of Calvinism or how anti-Trinitarianism uh, in England, for example, came out of Calvinism. They don't, they don't so Sinianism, they don't want to talk about that so much. Um, but universalism in the modern context is essentially Calvinism writ large. And what it is, is essentially uh, that, that same determinating relationship or deterministic relationship between um, the divine and the human, um, at least historically speaking, and then you also have a collapse, and this is why I said Christology is really important, as you, as you know, you have a collapse between the person-nature distinction. And so that 
Christ taking up human nature in the incarnation and in his resurrection, um, triumphantly over death, in, in, if you collapse person in nature, so something that's true of human nature, it must be true of every human person. If you're thinking along that line, that's going to entail universalism. And that kind of collapse is prevalent in, for example, or evidenced in the work of uh, David Bentley Hart. Um, this is not just a criticism that I've made. Uh, I kind of made it to um, Father Kimmel before uh, that whole thing blew up. I'm like, you're going to have to go deterministic. And it's going to turn on a Christological confusion. And, uh, gee, that's what happened. But um, I forget the professor at, I believe, Holy Cross, who did a critique of Hart's book. It was a very good critique. I recommend it. But he brought up the same point, right? It's a collapse of the person-nature distinction. Um, you can't hold that just because something is determinative at the level of nature that it's true of a person. And Maximus, the confessor, I think, makes this point in the distinction between ever being and ever well-being or ever ill-being, right? So the way that I think about it is, in Christ, everybody, because of his union with human, human nature, everybody is predestined to exist forever, but how they spend that eternal existence depends on how they use their free will. Um, but if you collapse those two things, then you're going to end up in universalism. And conversely, if you think that, if you believe in annihilationalism, for example, you're going to be much more likely to be an Aryan because either, either it's going to be the case that um, Christ is contingently related to human nature, so there's a much weaker relationship in the hypostatic union, or it's going to be the case that Christ is a contingent being, right, which is, which is why you can cease to exist, which I think explains in large measure why historically you have annihilationalism popping up in Aryan or Aryan type groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and other groups like that. Um, it doesn't always go that way, but it, it it tends to have this uncanny appearance of these things tend to go together. And I think there's this unspoken working in the systems um, that are highly intuitive. So people don't necessarily see that kind of Christological connection. You believe in annihilationalism because you believe in this about Christology or vice versa, right? Um, so it's interesting to see if you think about annihilationalism or conditional immortality and you think of universalism through a Christological lens, I think it will help make things clearer for people in terms of the price that they have to pay, right? which is one reason why I'm not any of those positions, because the price that I have to pay is to give up on the real Jesus. That's the price I have to pay. And I have to give up on the real church too. Um, you know, I remember being in one discussion about Hart's book and uh, somebody asked, well, you know, what church believes this, the stuff that Hart's saying? And um, one academic chimed in, <laughs> To the effect of saying the worldwide church of david bentley hart um so you know i'm not trying to be demeaning i think hart is obviously a highly intelligent person uh but he's not the church and he's not an apostolic seed and there's a big difference between the opinions of academics and the faith that's handed on and and i've made mistakes in, in my life and i and nobody should think that i'm like the faith or the guy or the guru and you know this you, you know this from knowing me so long that I'm always pushing people away the best I can. They, you look, you, nobody, can, nobody can tell you about the matrix. You have to see it for yourself. You have to learn this stuff for yourself. So that's why I'm always trying to push people to the literature. You've got to work through this stuff. You have to come to an understanding. There's, there's no shortcut. Um, and, and I don't want to be responsible for your eternal destiny. I got enough problems to worry about. I want a, a judgment day. I want the shortest line possible. Uh, with respect to, well, I went to hell because Perry said this, blah, 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 blah. No, please. Um, so I, I think that it's important to, to recognize that difference between what scholars say and the faith that's handed on. And my, my desire has always been to, to hold on to, to the historic faith, 
as, as I understood it into the best of my ability. And this is why even when I was received as Orthodox, there were things that I had not figured out. There were things that I did not understand. Uh, there were things that I wasn't necessarily comfortable with, but I kept my mouth shut because I knew that it was bigger than me and it was gonna take time and I was gonna to need to learn and I'm not gonna understand everything at once. And when you convert, you have, you have to be okay with that. You, you have to learn some obedience and say, okay, I'm gonna put this aside on the shelf for now. I haven't figured it out, right? And these problems take years. I mean, some of my deepest philosophical questions have taken a decade or two to work through and get answers to. So you, you, it's not all gonna come, you know, love don't come easy. Yeah, one of the things that I think, um, one of the most memorable things you said to me is that you know, finding truth is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> finding truth is hard, it's not easy. Um, and I think that in a whole range of arguments, and I see this as particularly relevant to a lot of the popular Roman Catholic apologetics, like how is the common man supposed to know the truth? Well, we've got this magisterium here and it's very obvious, you know, what, what is and what isn't infallible. But the way that scripture seems to frame things is it's designed to be difficult. It's something which is hidden. It's something which is buried in a field so that you have to do some digging so that when you actually get it, you're going to treat it with value. It's something that you work to get. Um, it's not easy. Uh, and um, I think we can kind of seg from that to your practical um, advice to people. What we have you know, various categories of people. Um, what would you say to somebody who is uh, just considering becoming Orthodox, what advice would you give give to them, practically speaking? Well, I mean, that's just the perfect segue because the thing I was thinking of was a was a quote from G.K. G. G. Chesterton, where Chesterton says to the effect, "I don't want to make more Christians; I want to make better Christians." And so, in my personal life, I'm always look on the lookout for people who have potential, who are good at something, or could be good at something, to be like, "Okay, that's the person." I want a mentor so they can go and do this. Um, I want Christians that are going to last because, you know, that's great that you're going to convert to whatever. I mean, the question is, you're going to last, right? Because, like, even if you're not stupid and you don't do practically stupid things in terms of getting yourself into legal trouble or other things, something bad is going to happen to you. Sooner or later, something bad's gonna happen to you. Uh, probably a lot of bad things are gonna happen in your life and you're gonna have to manage them. Um, so I'm always interested in trying to create people who are going to last, which is why I said earlier, in terms of identifying the different kinds of issues, like theoretical issues that are deal breakers and then practical issues on what you can live with and what you can't. Um, my goal is always to create people who have a kind of solidity that they end up having these kind of considered judgments that have considered all the data to the best of their ability, their educational level and all of those things. I don't think everybody has to be or can be a walking academic or things like this. But I do think that, look, we are in, it, you and I are in the Western world. We're in the United States, uh, just to out ourselves that way, shocking as that may be where a lot of people are college educated, they have more access to information now and better information now than they ever could have. I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember going through the card catalog, um, you know, in the library. I mean, that's what I did, you know. Uh, you wanna go look up a book on, on cults or the Trinity? Well, you gotta go look in the card catalog. Um, and, and yet you have people who know less. It's easier now than be, ever it was before. And, and they're using social media and other things is kind of a shortcut. And those things are fine as a tool, but there's a big difference 
there are things you're going to learn reading better quality literature and and better books and there are things you're going to learn like in a graduate seminar that you're never going to learn on your own that you're going to learn from somebody who's been doing this their whole life um you also learn some really good jokes from your professors every once in a while but um there are just things you you learn how to write how to speak well how to think through things how to construct an argument all these kinds of things how to think more clearly your vocabulary increases there's just a, just a whole number of things so i'm interested in creating people who last in the church and given our socio-cultural moment at, in the united states right now with all the anxiety and agitation i think that's very important for for myself i'm at a point in my life where most of my real questions uh have been answered i'm i'm satisfied i'm i'm content every once in a while something will come up but in terms of the issues that I set out to answer, I'm, I'm content. Um, so, and I've worked through, here's another thing. You're gonna run into intellectual roadblocks or speed bumps, and they're gonna be very disconcerting or unsettling for you. I'm at the other end of that where I've worked through, and, and Seraphim, you've worked through plenty of these kinds of things. Like when you come across a new one, you're just like, yeah, I'll put that on the shelf. I'll order some books about it. I'll get to that in maybe three or four years. You know, a big whoop de do. I can't answer this atheist at this particular moment. Um, okay, it's not the end of the world. I'm not worried about it. Um, and one of the reasons is because you work through all of those things. And then the other thing is, look, you know this in academia. You go to a colloquia where some professor of rumpty foo is giving a paper, and it may be some big, you know, philosopher or theologian historian and they get their butt kicked or something in the colloquial let's say well they don't give up their whole worldview or their whole position just because they ran into a bunch of objections from their peers they're like oh back to the drawing board and they'll work on that problem for another 10 years until they come up with an argument or a position that gets around all of those objections they just don't give up so you know this is just to christians in general i would say this you know, if you're dealing with atheists or objectors from other religions like Islam and things like this, you have to have tenacity. You have to be a bulldog. You have to hold on. Because number one, if even, if, let's say you say, oh, I can't handle why God allows evil. I'm not going to be a Christian anymore, blah, 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 blah. And you go be an atheist. Okay, yes, now you're an atheist. Okay, there's still evil in the world. You still have to explain it. You still have to deal with it. You still have to come up with some philosophical and ethical theory that accounts for it you're still going to have to do meta ethics you're still going to have to do normative ethics all of those things the problem doesn't go away you just moved it from one worldview to the other so you, you have to have a kind of tenacity whatever you're going to believe so here here i'm trying to shift from it's important what you believe but it's also important how you come to the beliefs that you have and you need to look at your procedures for that and you need to be very introspective and think, am I pushing this position away because I don't like it or because I have a good argument against it? And so in some way you get to a point where you stop controlling the ideas and the ideas start controlling you. And that's kind of scary territory, right? Um, and that's when you know you're being more intellectually honest. So like one of my best friends, probably my best friend in the world, when we were much younger, uh, much younger, we would spar theologically and do a lot of street witnessing and stuff together. We investigated a lot of stuff like about apostolic succession together. And we were reading certain stuff and we were reformed at the time and we were trying to come up with arguments against it. But then we, both of us started becoming convinced. And it was like, well, we don't want to believe this, but this is such a good argument, right? And, and then you have to role play. You have to put yourself in the other person's position. Like, how would I answer their objection to my objection? And, and you know, all of that is a very important part of critical thinking. Um, but if you're going to be intellectually honest and you want the truth, that's the kind of work you're going to need to do, which is why you need to take your time. You need to read the best literature that you can handle. If, if you understand everything that you're reading, you need to read something else. Because you're not going to grow. The average high school textbook is written at a fifth to sixth grade reading level now. 
Okay. And most popular fiction and nonfiction that people read is around a sixth, seventh grade reading level. If that's what you're reading, you're not going to grow very much. You need to push yourself. You need to read stuff that's hard. Oh, I don't understand what that word means. Well, good Lord, we have a phone that has dictionary on it. And look it up. Get off your butt and, and look up what the word means. Right? So I, I would say, people, the biggest thing is take your time. Take a few years. Read, study, visit other churches, other Orthodox churches. Make a list of things you don't like. Talk to your priest about the things you don't like. Think about what you can live with, what you can't. Um, you know, you, and you can't think of either the priest or or anybody like me online or anything like, you can't think of them as your life fulfillment coach. And, you know, this is one reason why I don't really talk about it. I don't have a conversion story yet. I think probably what I told you is probably the most extensive thing in terms of conversion that I've ever discussed. Um, one, because I may not make it. I may not be a Christian to the end of my life. You don't know that. I don't know that. Right? Um, I hope so. But I, but I don't know that. Um, so I'm not a Jesus replacement or a guru for you. Um, the other problem with like conversion stories that I have is in, in, you know, going along this line, and I think people should be aware, think of it this way, is there's this kind of, um, Gnostic separation between, well, that was this other person that did all that sins in the old life. That's not the real person. And you can see this in Gnosticism. There's a good book by Philip J. Lee, who's a Canadian Presbyterian called Against the Protestant Gnostics, which I would recommend people read. Uh, I don't agree with everything in the book, but it's it's insightful in many ways, particularly the first few chapters. Um, so that kind of disassociative thing, you know, where it's, oh, that was the old me, not this new converted me. In a lot of ways, you're going to be the same person you were before. You're going to have the same struggles, things like this. Um, I think it's important that people understand that. Um, and the other thing is, I'm interested in, I'm not interested in somebody who's newly minted. That's great. God bless them. Love them dearly. Well, I want to hear about conversion stories, so to speak, for people at the end of their life, right before they die. Like, okay, you're pretty much there. What did you learn along the way? And that's why the lives of the saints are, are important, right? You see what people learned and their foibles all along the way. Have you ever read that article on becoming and remaining an Orthodox Christian? Do you know the one I'm referring to? It rings a bell. If I have, I don't remember it. Yeah, um, it, it kind of says the same thing. I, I forget who who um, who wrote it. I think it was originally a talk. It said, "I'm, you know, the story is about how you became an Orthodox Christian. That's great, but I think the really interesting ones are how you remained an Orthodox Christian." And you know, it's been it's 2021 now, so I started consistently going to an Orthodox church 12 years ago now, and honestly, I remember there was. In particular, a gentleman um, who his conversion story involved going through literally every Christian tradition I'd ever like heard of before, and he was coming to Orthodox, and he had this like box full of icons he just bought, and then he kind of disappeared um, right. one day, and then literally like seven years later, he, he appeared again, and I, he, he kind of made the circulation again, um, but that's sort of an extreme example of what I've seen a lot of, which is for many people, orthodoxy is tragically kind of the last stop out the door of Christianity. Um, and it, it can be, but I don't, it, my experience has been that it's not going to solve their problem. Moving like that is not going to solve their problems. It's like, it's like Frankie Schaefer. Okay. Yeah, right, exactly. I, I watched Frankie Schaefer when I was reformed and and uh, him going through everything he went through and then leaving the Orthodox Church, that didn't solve his problems. He's just, he, The only thing that's consistent through Frankie Schaefer's journey is Frankie. Yeah, yeah. Right? It, it's the same 
So, and I'm not trying to make that a dig at, at Frankie, but let me put the point a different way. When I was younger, when I was an undergraduate, um, my university had an atheist club. And I went to the atheist club and I said I was a philosophy major. And they were like, great, because they didn't have any of those. And um, they never asked me if I was a Christian. Um, they asked me if I was an atheist. And when I was an undergraduate, I basically in philosophy just pretended to be a skeptic my whole way through. And that way in class, I could launch any objection and they could never tar me with being a Christian and dismiss me or I could never be graded down, right? I could launch any skeptical criticism of any position. So I just said, um, I said, you might say I'm a skeptic. I'm like, I'm so skeptical. I'm skeptical of atheism. And the atheists all thought that was really deep. And I was in this club for a year and I've gone to other atheist organiz other atheist meetings and spent time in them and um, other religious groups. And, you know, those people leaving Christianity and going to atheism, it didn't, it didn't solve their problems. It didn't solve their philosophical problems. And it didn't solve their other kinds of life problems that they had. So, you know, here's something else on a personal level. I, I've had some bad things happen to me. My life did not go the way that I had planned. It certainly academically didn't go the way that I had planned. And you know this, and other people know this. They know the story. I've written about it uh, to some extent. But, you know, there's a, there's, you may be at a point where you're broken. Your life's just crap. It's just on the floor in lots of little pieces. And you don't know what the hell to do. And you don't feel particularly like you love God. You may be really ticked off at God. And I think people need to hear that it's okay to be there. These kinds of problems, there isn't a kind of switch you can just turn and then it's all okay. It, the, these kinds of problems in here, they're not, they're not intellectual problems. You know, when I went through the stuff that I went through with the way that my life fell apart, um, nobody was going to make it better for me. Nobody was going to fix it for me. People were like, oh, just move on, right? It's like that scene in The Dark Knight where they're like, oh, they tell the kid to do, to do what he, he knows he can't do, which is move on, right? So you just learn to fake it. I know, I've been there. I've been in that point. And so I think people need to hear, oh, it's okay to be there. It's not, that's not necessarily where you're going to end up. So, okay, so you're mad at God. Okay, that's where you're at. If you're mad at God, you're engaged with God. That's the irony. That's the irony of a lot of these atheist groups. These atheists are more engaged with God than most Christians are. They just don't know it, right? In their anger, they're they're incredibly engaged. They're rest. They're they're with Jacob, man. They're ticked. I understand that, but it's okay if you're a Christian and you're having doubts or you don't know if you believe and you're having a hard time. I, just be in that place. You, yeah. you will make progress. Just recognize that that's where you are and you can't fix it right now. It may be hard for you to pray. I understand that. Maybe it'd be hard for you to go to church. I understand that as well. You need to talk to somebody. Even if you're, even if the talking is yelling, uh, you need to talk to somebody. Right? And I would say for, for Christian academics, like yourself or others, I would say that it's important that you have a hobby that's completely disconnected from anything intellectual. I don't care if it's fishing. Well, I care if it's fishing because I love fishing, but uh, riding a bike, cycling, anything. I mean, physical exercise is better. Anything like that. Get out of your head. Trust me, otherwise you burn out. I've seen it more times than I care to. Um, you need to have somebody you can talk to also. Um, and again, even if that talking is yelling. So I would, you know, for Christian academics, I would say that that's very important. Um, yeah. But for people who are coming into the church, take your time. Be very patient. Um, if you get a bad answer, don't accept a bad answer. I'm not saying you should be jerk to the person and say, oh, you're a jerk. You gave me a bad answer. I'm saying just file it away. Say, okay, I don't think that's a good answer. I need a better answer and keep looking. I didn't get to the point where I'm at and you didn't get to the point where you're at because you gave up. You have to keep looking. 
And that's going to be true regardless of what worldview you have. Yeah, I remember um, back in 2013, uh, I think 2013 was the year I had my last major, in one respect, it's kind of the last part of a single crisis of faith that went back several years, but in another respect, it could be considered its own thing. I remember I, I sent you a message. I was really struggling with this idea. Oh, what did I say? No, you, you were very helpful. No, it was, oh, it was, oh, I, was good. I was starting with the idea. Did the early Christians think that God had a body? Um, and kind of the big question was, is our doctrine of God just kind of a, a much later, you know, um, imposition on what was really a kind of primitive, you know, you know, God, the God of the Bible was just the Zeus, you know, he shows up, he's got a body and, and, and all of a sudden, and you kind of said, look, you got to, and I, I sent you a message and I said, you know, full disclosure, this is really freaking me out right now. And um, you said, you just got to chill out. Um, it's not going to take five minutes. Uh, go to a an academic library or like ProQuest or that sort of thing, get a bunch of papers on it. Um, right. And, you know, I can say I mean, it's been, it's been eight years. I wanted to say five years later, but eight years later. Um, it was fast. Yeah. Yeah. Eight years later. Um, I'm very, very, very happy with where that question ended up for me. And the funny thing is the question about the corporeality of God um, it opened up for me a whole range of new ways of thinking about things, which I didn't even conceive of as related initially, because right. um, one of the things which has really struck me in thinking through issues regarding Christianity, naturalism, orthodoxy is our biggest mistakes tend to be made um, not in making a wrong conclusion about a given argument in that, you know, this argument is, is not sound or this argument is sound. It's in not, you haven't even asked the right question to begin with, or you haven't framed the question in the right way to begin with. Because what I didn't realize at that time, and now it's so crazy to me that I didn't even think about it, is what do you mean by body? I mean, that's a really um, right. big question. Yeah. Uh, and what do you mean by matter? You th throw around material things, spiritual yeah. thing. Wow, that's a really... A, a complicated issue and there's a yeah, lot of well, work on it matter matter has a history yeah yeah and, and and one of the things which which now has struck me about biblical studies is that there's a lot of literature on what the biblical author said about the embodiment of god but the reality is these are very intelligent people but but many times they themselves do not realize that they have not asked what exactly is the body is it anything that's visible is it anything which can truly manifest itself spatially? Um, the whole range of things. And so that was a real instructive experience for me because I've, um, I, I think it helped me come to see just how big many of these questions were that I didn't know all of the subordinate questions that were involved and that freaking out about it didn't help. <laughs> right. And, 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 you know, that, that's, for me, the calculus that I ran when I was younger, and it's still with me, is I'm not the smartest person in the world. Shocking. Um, I cannot be the first person to deal with this issue. There have got to be other people out there who have dealt with this issue who are smarter than me. I just have to find them. And so I would counsel people who are dealing with all these different kinds of theological or philosophical issues. It's very helpful if you think of things in that way, right? It's not a question of if there's an answer. The question is, where is it, right? And what do you, are you willing to do what it takes and take the time to, to find out? Um, so I, I think that that's, a, that's something else that served me well is is recognizing that other people have got to engage these issues and i just need to go look which is one reason why when i was in university and in graduate school especially i would love to go to the university stacks and just wander the stacks because you never know what you're going to find it's a world of wonder 
And you just pull a book off the shelf and it's about something you never thought of before. It, it's, it's just a fantastic experience. And, you know, it's not because I think um, my commitment to academia and to the intellectual life and things like this, it's not because I think that, I certainly don't believe in the beatific vision, so that's not a reason. Um, and it's certainly because I don't, I don't think that intellectual life it makes you, is necessary for, for union with God and things like this. On the other hand, I don't, we're not Apollinarian, so the intellect is good and reason is good because Jesus had a human mind, so there's that. Um, but, you know, there's so many good things to learn and to enjoy, and there's an aesthetical element to it, and you can help people with a lot of that stuff. Um, so, I, you know, that's why I encourage people. There are pitfalls, too to be sure. But, you know, again, one of my guiding stars has been, well, this is the faith of the church. Because as you well know, like every year at Christmas or at, at Pascha or near Easter, right? There's some article in some magazine at the grocery store, Jesus really wasn't born here. And, you know, uh, Mary was really from China uh, or something like this. And you're like, what? And magically these things come out at Christmas and Easter every year, right? And there's never one about Muhammad during, you know, Eid for some strange reason. I don't know why that is. They never want, no, the academics don't do these articles about Muhammad for some reason. You know, I mean, it, it, it you know, I mean, maybe it'll blow up in their face or something. Um, so, yeah, see, I, I think it was always a recognition like, well, look, this is the, the faith hasn't lasted this long because some scholar Rumpty Foo thought of something right? Um, that's not to say that there aren't real intellectual challenges as being a Christian, but you got to be patient, take your time, and, and here's the other thing. Here, so on the other end, to kind of give people a tongue lashing, um, if you're college educated and you're living in, say, the United States or Europe or Canada or someplace like that, and you go to a church and you don't have a single bookshelf, a book on your bookshelf about church history, you don't have a single book about biblical hermeneutics. Uh, you don't have a single book about Christology or the Trinity or the resurrection or the sacraments. Something's wrong. Like, and those should not just be like uh, little kitty books. They, sh they should be something serious, right? Um, it's inexcusable. Look, if you were in a village in, you know, the remote part of southern Chile, and you just went to church, and you didn't have a library, couldn't read, or only you know fifth grade, whatever. And the the priest preaches a sermon. God bless you. Seriously, that's God bless you. I'm great with that. I don't have a problem with that. But we're here in the Western world. We're not at that place. And evangelistically, we here's something else, and you know this. We're losing across the board, not just the Orthodox, but everybody, what, 50 to 70% of our kids to secularism, they go to university, they never go back to any church of any kind the rest of their life. At the exact point at which the secular worldview that's being pushed is its most brittle. And it's like, wait, we're losing to this garbage? How are we losing to this? This is ridiculous. People need to get off their butts. It is all hands on deck. It really is. If you're a layman and you're college educated, pick up, pick up my endorsed Byzantine theology. Start reading. Start reading. Start learning. You don't get to sit on the bench anymore. At C.S. Lewis, um, he says... Uh... In, I think it's mere Christianity. You have the responsibility. You don't have the responsibility to be the cleverest person in the world. You have the right. responsibility to be as clever as you can be. Um, exactly. And in, in last battle, there's the donkey. So maybe if you hadn't spent so much time talking about how dumb you were, you would have realized that you had the capacity to think this through. And I, I really think people are, you know, people say, Seraphim, you're so smart. And, you know, ooh, you know great. Um, but 
the reality is that I think people are a lot smarter than they give themselves credit for. Or they have the capacity to be a lot smarter. Than they if they them. apply themselves. Look, I'm not that smart. I'm really not. I was a 13-year-old kid who had a Bible and a copy of Mere Christianity. And I got into some Josh McDowell and then a bunch of other stuff. And that led to other things. But I was committed to learning and to reading. And applying myself in that way. So I, I, I think if you're in a if you're college educated and you're in a Western country, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask that you have one bookshelf of Christian literature, nonfiction stuff on church history, the sacraments, the Trinity, the incarnation, some apologetic material on the existence of God or the resurrection and things like this something about hermeneutics. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to think that an educated person should have one bookshelf devoted to that. I don't think that's asking too much. Yeah, yeah. I remember I was in kind of similar experience that you, you described earlier. It was in the Notre Dame library, the one of the um, floors just devoted mm -hmm. to theology. And I just thought, my God, thank God that I'm blessed to live in the 21st century and modernity has its problems but right. you're literate i mean that's extraordinary you're literate and you have easy access to this incredible repertoire of information sure. which at bottom is about god's world and that's a blessing and he picked he decided to create you at this moment and so live in this moment so um, going to a library for me going to a university library for me is like sitting out in Bryce National Park or Anza Borrego Desert in the middle of the night looking up and seeing the Milky Way. That's the experience for me. I, it's an experience of wonder, right? It's just, it's just amazing to me, right? I mean, I mean, there's a reason why Kant said there are two things that instill wonder in, in humanity, the moral law within and the starry host above. And um seeing a li a great library i but that's the experience it's, it's just i re it makes me realize how small um i am and you know it's like that line from uh raiders of the lost ark you know this is history we are just moving through it right but this is history right so so i mean those are the kinds of things that i would I would tell people who are considering, be patient, read something that's hard for you, right? Read something that's a little difficult. You don't understand everything. Push yourself. You'd be glad you did in the end. Well, I wanted to, before we wrap up, someone did uh, ask about apostolic succession. And uh, um, I think you have some, um, some good, good, good things to say about that. Um, you've recommended, uh, I just want to plug this book before I forget, Felix Serlot's Apostolic Succession. Is it true? I think that's what it's called. Yes. Um, uh, so, you and you mentioned earlier uh, the importance of apostolic succession to you know, becoming Orthodox. Um, let's say, you know, you're talking to a Protestant, um, he says, tell me why I should believe in apostolic succession. What's the case that you would make? Well, the, the case that I would make, I mean, part of the case is going to have to be clarifying depending on what their background is, because there's all kinds of confusions. So apostolic succession, we need to get clear about what it is and about what it's not. And uh, here's what it's not. It's not a just pedigree line. It's not one guy touching another guy. Uh, it's not genealogical. It's not by inheritance. Um, it's not a sufficient condition for teaching true doctrine. It's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. Um, it's a necessary condition to constitute a church. Um, and I would appeal to things in the New Testament about like how you get a church. Um, somebody, how should they believe unless somebody preaches? And how should somebody preach unless somebody is sent? Well, what's this sending? All this sending language in the gospels as the Father sent me, so I send you. The Father sent me into the world. All of these kinds of things play a role, um, an evidentiary role as well, and set up a pattern. I would also appeal to the Old Testament, 
and show how ordination there, uh, how offices were conveyed. They weren't taken up upon yourself. Um, they were conveyed and it was conveyed through a type of ordination. And the New Testament continues that. Um, some of the other clarifying work that I would do, I would try to make it plain that the idea, idea of a monarchical episcopate is not the idea in principle or in its essence of there only being one bishop in an area. The term can be used that way historically among scholars, but really the claim of apostolic succession is that monarchy is that the bishop alone is the source for orders. So the presbyter, presbyters or elders and deacons come out of the episcopate or the overseer, the bishop. And so um, we don't have any early church cases of Presbyterian ordination, certainly not a diaconal ordination. So there's zero data set in terms of the Presbyterian theory uh, outside the New Testament. So uh, that's a problem for Presbyterians. All the ordinations that we have recorded are all Episcopal ordinations. Um, the other thing that I would point out is that the term presbyter or elder, um, it is true that it's it can be used interchangeably with the word for bishop, but interchangeability doesn't necessarily imply semantic identity. It's possible to use terms interchangeably without implying that they mean the same thing. So here's the idea, for example, that Sirlock gives, which I think is a very powerful idea, that the term presbyter um, functions like our common English term for minister. So the apostles are ministers, the deacons are ministers, the presbyters are uh, ministers but an apostle is not a deacon, right? So to talk about that they're all elders doesn't necessarily pick out the office of, of the presbyterate. It's just talking about them all being common ministers. And so in that way, there's a development of terminology. The other thing that um, I would point out is, for example, biblically in, in the book of Hebrews, for example, it speaks about no one takes this office unto himself. And that's a recognition that even in the New Testament, that um, offices are given. They are not, there's no self-ordained people. And it's always by the laying on of hands. And there are other passages, for example, St. Paul makes it very clear, talks about the gift that is within Timothy through the laying on of my hands, Paul says. It's instrumental. It's through the laying on of hands. It's not contiguous with the laying on of hands. It's not something that happens at the same time. It's through the laying on of Paul's hands. Um, and so I think that's some of the biblical material uh, that I think is important. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's a very important issue, especially now, for two reasons. One, we are seeing the collapse and disintegration of popular evangelicalism at a theological level and at an ecclesiastical level. One, because the non-denominational churches are so easy, they're a victim of their success. They're easy to copy, okay? And then when you get one of these mega churches, like you had like, with Calvary Chapel, for example, okay? You had uh, Papa, Papa Chuck, who started it. Um, he dies, they have no successive succession mechanism. And then it just becomes a big fight over money and property. They have no way to keep the thing going, which seems really strange that the early church did, but they don't. Um, that's a really big issue. The other issue is, in my opinion, probably one of the most important issues in this century for churches and for Christians uh, will be ecclesial identity and ecclesial discipline. Is there a line and where is the line? Now, you know this, and I mean, we can see this already playing out in the evangelical world with all the issues about human sexuality, okay? And we already know that the mainline denominations have gone the way of all flesh. They're toast. I mean, in our lifetime, there won't, within what they're saying, within less than 15 years, there won't be an Episcopal church in the United States, and there won't be a Church of England either. They'll be gone, right? Um... The Methodist just fractured. PCUSA, they're pretty much toast. Elka's pretty much toast. Um, Rome is, I mean, 
I'm, I'm not trying to be mean, but I mean, it's a mess, right? Whatever they've got on paper is nice on sexual morality, but the reality is, is a mess. Um, and honestly, as Orthodox Christians, um, and I want to be very, very clear here, it's my firm conviction that we are next on the menu. We are next on the menu. The Greek Archdiocese, in my opinion, is the Episcopal Church circa 1960. It's waiting to happen. And we need to be very serious about it. So the question is going to be, do you have a line on, on this person can be a member or this person can't be a member or not? Because if you don't, you're done. You're finished. It'll be a question until the Skittles Club and the rainbow flag shows up and then you're done. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, Jesus says, Revelations, uh, to a church which is faithful preeminently. I have this against you that you tolerate. That woman Jezebel calls herself prophetess teaching and seducing right. and practice sexual morality, food sacrifice idols, in other words, um, uh, false doctrine. Um, and I think that's a really important point that you mentioned in relation to us, whether or not a person agrees with what you said about the greek archdiocese or not that in orthodoxy you're not coming to the place which is immune from right. a slipping on sexual morality now right. i happen to believe and i think you would agree that will come through but that's not because of you know what we would call orthodoxy as an institution it's because christ is ultimately running the show and he will See us. Well, and, and there's nothing to prevent the churches here from blowing it and going out of existence. Yeah, you, uh, we're not we're not the church in toto. Yeah, uh, so that's entirely possible. Um, I'm not putting that. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's you know, I'm it's the Picard line. You know, the, they've assimilated entire worlds. They've destroyed entire denominations, and we fall back. Yeah. The line is here. This far. The, uh, I've got nowhere else to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I'm just being honest. I've got nowhere else to go. Yeah. So for uh, I'm all in. I'm all in. For, and this is why I tell people, you for Orthodox who are looking at this, you need to get plugged in. It's all hands on deck. You need to go to your parish and find out what you can do at your parish. It may not be teaching or something else, but but I mean it's all hands on deck. We we playtime is over. This this Christian culture where people are genuinely Christian, we have generations of people who have never even been in a church of any kind. They have no Christian consciousness. All the layers of Christian saturation on Western culture are being we're being peeled like an onion. And if you think that that culture is going to leave you alone, um, when they're done, you are sadly mistaken. You have no idea what paganism is. You've never seen paganism on a cultural level before, fully manifested. You've never seen it. Yeah. I, you know, one, um, I was reading an article about uh, the adoption of children, just the history of adoption. And it was referring to um, Christian families, especially evangelicals, who adopted children. Right. And some, somehow the article was trying to make them out to be a villain for adopting third world children or whatever. Oh. But, but but what struck me is no good deed deserves to go unpunished yeah exactly but, but what struck me is um it described christian households as interpreting this in light of the evangelical doctrine that god adopts them as his children and what was so striking is it was referring to this as if it was something just bizarre and foreign right like the strange christian doctrine <laughs> that god adopts us as his children and it, it it was kind of a surreal moment because like wow well here we are in a society which doesn't even which perceives this as you know a pagan might in the in the second or third century like well this like, is a real oh they, the evangelicals they didn't get that from the bible they must have gotten that from like chuck swindoll or something some recent <laughs> book i mean it's yeah yeah no and the, the ignorance in the in the secular press about religion i tell my children just if, if it's in the press and they're talking about religion just ignore it because you pretty much guaranteed that they have no idea what they're talking about um i mean terry mattingly's stuff on this is is really great at get religion i mean he points stuff like this out all the time um so you know I, but i'm a firm believer that to church discipline 
is going to be a huge issue um, for Christians in this in this century. It's going it is going to be one of the defining issues. I could be wrong, but that's that's the way that that I see matters. So on on apostolic succession, I want to ask you just one more kind of supporting okay. question, and then we can uh, wrap sure. up. Um, so one of the things that will often be raised by defenders of apostolic succession in terms of patristic quotations is that passage from Irenaeus where he's talking about the successions in the churches. And it seems to me that people generally are confusing what he's talking about because he's not actually talking about the succession in terms of a sacerdotal laying on of hands from one episcopal um, line of ordination to the next. He's talking about, well, there's no, in the Church of Rome, for example, you have one bishop after another, right? But it doesn't require that the preceding bishop of Rome ordains the next bishop of Rome. He calls it succession, but he's not talking about sacerdotal succession. He's talking about there's a continuity in the existence of this office. Um, do you think that this Irenaeus passage has reference or has some kind of relevance to what we mean by apostolic succession? And what do you think? Where would you go if, if you want to point to early evidence outside the New Testament of this sacerdotal idea of laying on of hands from one generation to the next? I think in Irenaeus, it's both. I don't think it's one or the other. Um, one of the reasons is that, you know, it's very likely that bishops were not ordained by just one other bishop. And so you're going to have multiple overlapping lines. And so you get that sense that there is a succession of office. It's not necessarily just that predecessor who did the ordaining, right? That's not what's necessary. But whenever we do see ordination and we do see ordination rites, it's always through the laying on of hands. It's always through a bishop. Um, there's no other way to um, that you get either in the Old Testament or in the New Testament or in the early church that you get people who have an office, unless it's directly by God. Um, Sometimes people make the mistake I've seen of saying, well, it says that they have, they appointed or they chose for themselves these persons. Yeah, well, that's true. In the book of Acts, you have the, the first deacons that are elected, right? I'm all, I'm all fine with prisoners electing ministers, but then, it, then the, they went and got ordained. So sometimes people make the mistake of thinking that, oh, well, this is just some mere appointment and elector, you know, electing people. I don't think that that's the case at all. Um, I think that's a very bad form of reasoning there. So in terms of the evidential base, there's material in Hippolytus um, in terms of liturgical texts and what he says in the prayers for ordination that are very clearly sacerdotal in terms of the conveying of the Holy Spirit. Um, there's other liturgical documents uh, around that same time. And then, you know, here's another, just an incidental fact, is if there had been a non-sacerdotal ministry um, and a non-apostolic uh, succession, a non-episcopal three-fold ministry, episcopate ministry, why is it that it didn't survive anywhere? We can't talk it up to the Roman Empire because those churches outside the Roman Empire, uh, like in Persia and as far away as uh, China or India, all ended up with the same form and they all ended up with the same form with no dispute or argument whatsoever right now these are the people who fight over the date of easter they fight over um how churches should be decorated they fight over all kinds of things but there's not a fight over ordination and there's it, it, there's this supposed in the Presbyterian theory that there's this a supposed um, usurpation that takes place as if we ever have any biblical case of a lower order becoming a higher order. We don't. Biblically speaking, it's always a div divine commissioning, right, directly by God, and then the lower orders come down from that. That's always how it works in the Bible. But you, these are the same people who supposedly were A-OK -okay with this usurpation by some presbyters and it became universalized outside the Roman empire all from England, all the way to China and into Africa and India. And nobody said a peep. Um, that's, you know, highly implausible and improbable. 
So I think combined with the material from Hippolytus, there's a number of other patristic texts and liturgical texts that I think are clearly sacerdotal or sufficient to be sacerdotal um, that I would use for, for an argumentative base. So the stuff I've done on apostolic succession before rehearses that, but you can go through and look at, I mean, there's plenty of older works. There were a number of high church Anglicans um, who defended because of the position they were in defended the idea of apostolic succession against Presbyterians. It's one of the older works is Charles Gore, The Church and the Ministry. Uh, there's obviously, I think the single most comprehensive book is uh, Felix Surlot's Apostolic Succession, Is It True? But there's other material from Kenneth E. Kirk, uh, The Apostolic Ministry, which is a collection of older essays. Um, there's literature on this going back all the way to the Caroline Divines um, in, uh, I believe, the 17th century, 18th century as well. So uh, Percival has a little book on apostolic succession um, from the 19th century. So there, there's tons of literature and, and data that's considered both liturgically and from patristic texts. Um, so we, we just don't have any Presbyterian ordinations and we don't have any Baptist type elder ordinations. So, um, whatever somebody wants to think about this supposed transitional period between the apostles and Ignatius, for example, um, we don't have any data for Presbyterian ordinations. It's just not there. Um, so all the, all the ordination data we have is Episcopal, which, you know, I mean, you're going to go with the data. All right, so um, any final words that we didn't get to that you want to make sure my audience hammers into their head? No, I think we're good. All right. Um, so it's this good is... seeing you again. I haven't seen you since, uh, since, I mean, well, I think I might have seen you, but I've seen you online, but 20, I haven't seen you really. 2013 is when, when, when I, uh, yeah, we were at um, Kevin, we were Allen's, Kevin house. Allen's house. Kevin Allen's house, yeah. yeah. Um, Memory of soul. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, this is Perry Robinson. Uh, uh his full name is the lovely Perry Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and I'm gonna blow smoke your way since you were <laughs> since you were committed to doing that for me. Um, I watched Sarah Min, Seraphim uh, Hamilton for a long time, uh, when he was much, much younger. I think the YouTube videos of you as some high school junior high kid online doing apologetics is still up there somewhere uh he's been around a long time he does he does very good work um he's certainly much better at biblical theology than i will ever be so uh, you know you you want to use this for a plug I'm, I'm plugging you man because i i i do i do think you do very good work i think you're very sharp you're very gifted i think you have a lot of gifts to give to to god's church and to the kingdom and to help people which I think is, which is, you know, a big reason why we do this kind of, I'm certainly not doing it for money. Um, so I, I think uh, people should, I think there's a lot of good stuff coming from Seraphim and I think you should stay tuned. Thank you very much. And uh, that means a lot coming from Perry, who hasn't mentioned, you know, we, we are, we are who we are um, in relation to everyone else. And so I don't know if Perry hadn't, I forget how we got in contact, but um if you i don't remember either yeah if you hadn't i remember back in 2012 i asked you i think about the doctrine of the energies what would you recommend and you and think the filioque was in there somehow and you wrote me a, like a long message which if you don't know perry you don't know how unusual <laughs> that is <laughs> uh, a few years later he, I, I was sending him some questions he said what the hell is this is this poke perry day or something but he sent me a long a long message and that um along with his, uh, his, his advice and mentorship over the years have been uh, really important. So I want to thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I think people are going to get a lot out of it. So go to his blog, energetic procession dot, um, is it blogspot or WordPress? WordPress. WordPress. Energetic procession dot wordpress.com. And is there anything people should be looking out um, from you uh, that's upcoming? Yeah. Um... I'm doing uh, a live stream with uh, Sam Shamoon on justification, 
uh, analyzing the material from Anthony Rogers on Sola Fide in the Church Fathers or allegedly in the Church Fathers. I'll be doing that in December. That's coming out. Um, I have a, a written piece critiquing Aristotle Papa Nicolau on sexual ethics um, that I've been chipping away at that probably in January I will I will have out. Is that going to be on the blog? Yeah, that'll be on the blog. And then I have, I have after that, I have um, some stuff on um, eternal suffering or eternal punishment and universalism. Uh, that'll be after um, the uh, piece on uh, Aristotle, Papa, and Nicolau and uh, the uh, blog that shall but not be named. Um, <clears throat> the people out of Fordham. So to put it as terribly as I can. So uh, that's kind of what I'm, what's coming out next what I'm doing next. Um, I have some longer term projects, um, probably in the next two years. There's at least one, if not two book projects that uh, I'll probably be engaging. Uh, one on uh, atheism. Um, uh, there's a book project there. And then there's some material on uh, another potential book project after that on Solo Scriptura. So, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, and I want to thank you again for coming on. And uh, oh, and by the way, while I'm still recording, check out his recommended reading section on energetic procession. Like I'm, I get, a, I punt people to that when they ask, "What should I read?" Just read every book there, and then you'll like, then you'll start to glow. Um, so, <laughs> so thanks again, Perry. All right, it's my pleasure. Have a good night. You too.